Dr. P here, and our topic today is simple. War is not only hell, it's a hell of a mess. And how does that work in conjunction with games? Well, in fact, this is the second great dichotomy of wargaming. Because game players, especially serious game players, want control. They want to feel they succeed or fail on their own merits, not because they get gypped by the game. Whereas real war is a big mess, as epitomized by the old poem about for want of a nail, a shoe was lost for want of a shoe, a horse was lost for want of a horse, a message was lost for want of a message, a battle was lost for want of a battle, a country was lost, and all for the want of a nail. Lots of chance, lots of chaos in war. The two are not compatible. Now, conquest games, which don't really have much to do with war, as I've discussed, are all about control. There's no realistic mess required. On the other hand, simulations, which are sort of at the opposite end from conquest games, must reflect at least a portion of the mess if they're going to be much of a simulation. But they can't reflect all the mess, or as much of a mess as games can reflect, because it would be very frustrating to most game players, unless perhaps they're playing solo, and then they don't worry about it because they're not playing competitively. The larger, the more strategic the scale, the less the mess is true. There are a few command and control problems on a three-month scale in modern times. Now, if you go back to older times when long-distance travel was slow, then the command and control problems could be very, very pronounced. Central direction doesn't play much part in that situation. This is why the Roman Empire ultimately went to multiple Caesars and emperors, two emperors and two Caesars, to improve the reaction to invasions because it took so long for word to get from one place to another, especially along the borders which were deep inland at a time when seaborne communication was much faster than land communication. So let's talk about some of the commander's problems, both strategic and tactical. Command control, we have failure of communication. The message doesn't get through, like for one of a nail. We have failure of understanding when the message does get through, and that may be because it's not written well or because the reader is under pressure or just doesn't understand. Then we have failure of leaders to do what they're told to do. Or sometimes they decide that what they've been told to do is not a good idea because it's come from a long way away and because there's been a time delay. Then we have uncertainty. We have uncertainty of enemy intentions, of course. We have uncertainty of the real combat strength of units on both sides. Well, sometimes that's not true. Napoleon had a pretty good idea of what the guards could do, for example, and what his artillery could do. But frequently in warfare, you don't have that prior experience. And so you don't know what the real combat strength is. We have uncertainty of the number of enemy units, the location of enemy units. That comes in fog of war, which is the next thing that you can't see beyond your own line of sight. And that can be obscured by smoke or weather. Where is the enemy? That's a fundamental thing that most generals don't know most of the time. Sometimes they don't even know where their own units are. Fog of War is commonly used in video games. It's the natural way things work because if you, you're, as a programmer, don't tell the computer to show something to the player, they're not going to know it. On the other hand, Shenandoah Games avoided Fog of War entirely when they converted their tabletop Battle of the Bulge game to video because they're catering to people who are game players much more than people who are expecting a strong historical experience on a tablet. Then the biggest of all, perhaps, we have morale and failure of morale. You know, Napoleon said, morale is to the physical as three is to one. This is an especially an influence in medieval battles where there's no clear line of command. In a medieval or ancient battle, when the commander died, his side usually lost the battle. Why there's that failure of line of command, I don't know, but that seems to be the way it was. 
Of course, there's fear of death in battles. There's fear of failure. Now, miniatures battles where you use small figures often have morale rules built in, but the result is that a chance here or a chance here can determine who wins the game. In the Battle of Hastings, William, who later became William the Conqueror, had to rally troops a couple of times because the shout went out that he had been killed because his horse had been killed. He had to find another horse, get up, and rally the troops. There was no second in command. If he had actually been killed, the Normans would have lost the battle. There are many ways to represent these problems. Uh, most of these are tabletop methods. Again, with a computer, you've got something that can keep track of things and can represent in the background those things like messages not getting through and the fog of war and so on. So, in tabletop games, and of course all these techniques can be applied to video games, because many video games are more or less tabletop games on a computer, we have block games where you see that there's a block there but you don't know how strong it is. We have activations and action points which limit which pieces can move. We have upside down units which hide their identity or their strength. Chit draws which can be used to determine which pieces move and which don't. We can have team play especially in miniatures. Uh, some miniatures games there are written orders and the commander writes orders and gives them to his subordinates and then they screw things up. And of course the person writing the orders is not a professional at that either. Napoleon had a chief of staff who was really good at converting Napoleon's intentions into orders, but he didn't go to Waterloo. We can have computer intervention even in a tabletop game. But, once again, we don't want to overdo this representation of command and control problems, or the game becomes a mess that gamers, game players, don't want. And again, for solo games, it's probably okay because there's not a competitive aspect or not as much of a competitive aspect. That's true even of tabletop games and, and video games. If essentially, you can't lose a video game, a single player video game, because you can just keep trying until you succeed. So, in general, we have to say tabletop and video war games are nothing like reality. It'll never feel like the real thing. Those who emphasize you are there, you are in command, they're fooling themselves. But they wouldn't really want to be there, would they? What games are is often a representation of generalship, not of war. And that turns it... Generalship is more like a game. We just remove many of the uncertainties of generalship when we make the game. Video games can come closer to the visceral feelings of warfare, but often video games are more an abstraction than a model. Keep in mind, every game design is a compromise. You have to compromise in some way to cope with the great dichotomies, including this one. 